As always, please pause the video, reread the problem, give it some consideration before listening on. We are told that first the switched is closed a long time. So what we're gonna go ahead and do is close this switch. Now, as soon as we close the switch, then current begins to flow through the circuit. So the current will exit the positive terminal of the battery. It'll reach a junction here and sort of split up. So some of the current will go here and start depositing positive charges on this plate of the capacitor, which actually causes the other plates to develop a negative charge. And then the rest of the current goes this way through the junction, kind of takes a turn here. Meanwhile, the current that went through the other side will kind of join back up with the other current and they'll all return to the negative terminal of the battery and kind of go through the circuit again. But this switch is closed for a long time. So eventually what happens is that the plates of the capacitor charge up to the extent that current can no longer flow through the right branch of the circuit. This plate basically becomes positively charged enough to the extent that the current coming in is repelled and eventually it's repelled so much that it just stops bothering going through that part of the circuit. So after a very long time, we can actually essentially remove the right portion of this circuit. And so the circuit looks like this. Now, of course, we're not saying we physically remove that portion of the circuit, but for the mathematical analysis, all that matters after a long period of time is the current going clockwise through this loop of the circuit. Now, it is a loop, so we're going to be able to apply the loop rule to figure out how much current is actually flowing through the circuit after a long period of time. So the loop rule tells me that I can begin anywhere within the loop, and I choose to begin at the negative terminal of the battery, and then I'm going to move clockwise through my loop until I get back to the negative terminal. As I do that, I'm going to keep track of potential changes. So for instance, beginning at the negative terminal of the battery and moving to the positive terminal, I have an increase in potential. Going from negative to positive is an increase in potential, and the amount of potential is symbolized by this fancy little E here. So I have a positive E, an increase in potential as I move to the positive plate. Now I continue my journey clockwise through the circuit until I encounter R2. When I come to a resistor, I'm going to have a potential drop. It's sort of like a ball rolling down a hill. We drop in our potential. So Ohm's law tells me that the drop in potential across a resistor is equal to the current times the resistance value of that resistor. So again, we have a voltage drop or a potential drop. That's going to be a minus sign. I take the current flowing through the circuit and I multiply by the resistance value, which in this case is R2. Continuing clockwise through the circuit, same story. I encounter another resistor, another potential drop. It's going to be minus the current times R1. And when I return back to the negative terminal of the battery, which is where I started, then Kirchhoff's loop rule says to set those potential changes equal to zero. Now, I'm going to go ahead and add those negative IR terms to the other side. We can then factor out the current on the right-hand side and then divide both sides of the equation by that parenthetical term. Now, the question gives us the value of E as well as the resistance values. They're given in kiloohms for both R1 and R2, so let's make sure we multiply by 1,000 to convert them into ohms. The values are plugged in. When we compute that, we get eight times 10 to the minus four amps. That is how much current is flowing through the circuit. Now, you may wonder, well, why do we need to know the amount of current flowing through the circuit? Well, now that we have the current, we can actually calculate the specific potential drop across R2. We're gonna see in just a moment why we want the potential drop across R2. But for the moment, we're just going to calculate that. Now remember, the potential drop across R2 is going to equal the current flowing through it times the resistance value, R2. We have both of those terms on the right-hand side. Let's plug in. And when we compute that, we can see that the potential drop across R2 is 12 volts. Now, why is that important? Why aren't we you know, looking at R1, for example? What is so special about R2? Well, let's bring back the rest of the circuit. Remember that we had that capacitor. See if we can uncover it. There it is. We had that capacitor that was fully charged up. Now, there's no more current going through this right portion of the circuit, but that doesn't mean nothing interesting isn't happening. We have a charged capacitor, and because it is charged, it's going to have a certain potential difference across its plates. Well, what is that potential difference across its plates? It's going to be the same as R2. Remember that R2 and that capacitor are in parallel with one another, and because they are in parallel with one another, they will have the same potential difference across their 
sort of terminals. So we can say that the potential across this capacitor, across the plates of the capacitor, is also going to equal 12 volts once it has been fully charged up. Okay, so it is fully charged. It's got a potential difference of 12 volts. What happens next in this question? Well, next, the switch is now opened up at a time labeled to be T equals zero. So we're going to open up that switch right there. Look at that. And once the switch is open, current can no longer flow through this portion of the circuit, the one outlined right here. So we can actually now eliminate that sort of portion of the circuit because current can't flow through it. So now look what we're left with. We are left with basically an RC circuit. We have a resistor and we have a charged capacitor. We're gonna let the current flow now. So charges start hopping off of the plate here. They start traveling around and they start creating a current and that current will flow through R2. And that's exactly what we're looking for. We're looking for the current in R2, but not at time zero, but rather four milliseconds later. So how on earth can we find the current through R2 after four milliseconds has passed? Well, as we stated, the capacitor is discharging. There is a lovely equation that dictates the discharging of a capacitor. And there it is. We can see that the potential across the capacitor plates equals its initial potential and then multiplied by this exponential term right here. So we have the initial potential across the plates of the capacitor at time zero. That was the 12 volts once it had fully charged. So let's fill that in. And then we can plug in the given values. We know time is four milliseconds. So that's four times 10 to the minus three seconds. The resistance value in this problem right now is the value of R2. That was 15,000 ohms. And then the capacitance is 0.4. It's microfarad. So you multiply that by 10 to the minus six to get it into farads. So let's plug that into our V equation on the left-hand side. And when you compute that, you get the potential across the plates of the capacitor is 6.16 volts. So in this moment of time, the capacitor is almost serving like a little battery. It's producing at this moment 6.16 volts of potential across its plates. That means there's going to be 6.16 volts of potential across the resistor. You can think of the resistor as being connected to a battery, except in this case, the battery is that capacitor. So now we can calculate the current because Ohm's law for the resistor is given as follows. If we divide both sides by R, we have an expression for the current. All we need to do is plug in the volts we just calculated, as well as the resistance value of R2, which again was that 15,000 ohms. And when we simplify that, we get a current of about 4.11 times 10 to the minus four amps. That is the current flowing through the resistor R2 after four milliseconds from when the switch was reopened.